Hello everybody, how are you today? Today we are going to proceed with activities 4 and 5 which deal with the detection of genetic polymorphism and genetic identity of individuals. It's going to be on your book pages 64 to 69. First of all, we're supposed to uh, review the name of the restriction enzymes or what do uh, restriction enzymes mean. First of all, the restriction enzymes are the biological scissors. They are said to be biological scissors because they have a very important property of cutting the DNA or the RNA. They are naturally produced by special types of bacteria to defend themselves against invading viruses and this is what makes them very special tools which are being used nowadays in many procedures uh, like the DNA fingerprinting, transgenesis, and so on because they found out that these restriction enzymes are the tools that allow the bacteria to defend themselves when they are um, attacked by viruses. So in this way, they can cut the RNA of the viruses and protect themselves from this invading virus trying to invade the bacteria. There are around 100 restriction enzymes that are identified and each one of them has its own recognition site. Usually this recognition site varies from, eight to four, from four to eight uh, base pairs, uh, the length of this recognition site. The enzyme, after knowing its recognition site, after noticing the recognition site, this enzyme is going to cut the DNA double strand at a special site known as the cleavage site. Example of, an, uh, of a restriction enzyme is the ECOR1, which is obtained from bacteria known as Escherichia coli or E. coli. And usually this uh, ECOR1 restriction enzyme has a recognition site of six base pair sequences. Those are the base pair sequences that the uh, ECOR1 can uh, recognize. They are the GAATTC, and on the other DNA strand, which is complementary to it, we will have the CTTAAG. Usually, after knowing this recognition site, after recognize, recognizing this recognition site, the enzyme is going to cut the DNA on each strand between the G and the A. So it is going to cut at this position here and at this position here as well. Here is an example of how the ECOR1 works. So this is a target gene, okay? This is a gene, and the, uh, it's obtained from a plasmid. It's a vector or plasmid obtained from uh, special uh, types of bacteria. And uh, once they are placed with the ECOR1 enzyme, the enzyme is going to recognize this recognition site, which is the GAATTC, and it is going to cut between the G and A on each strand. So it is going to cut between G and A here, and between G and A here. It will also move on to search for the same sequence, which is known as the recognition site, and once it notices this sequence, which is the GAATTC on the first strand, or CTTAA, um, a G on the other strand, it is going to cut the DNA between G and A. So in this way, you notice that the DNA is going to be cut into two pieces having those sticky ends. Another restriction enzyme known as NOT1 restriction enzyme, so as we said before, there are around 100 restriction enzymes. We are giving just uh, examples of these restriction enzymes like the ECOR1 which is obtained from the E. coli uh, bacteria and the NOT1 restriction enzyme is another enzyme obtained from another microorganism known as the Nocardia otitidis cavarium. Uh, the NOT1 usually has another recognition site which is specific to it. This recognition site is the GCGGCCGC and after it notices this or recognizes this recognition site, it is usually going to cut between the C and the G on both uh, DNA strands. Okay? So this is how restriction enzymes usually work. 
After knowing the restriction enzymes, we're supposed to know now uh, how do we use the restriction enzymes in a very important process known as the gel electrophoresis. Uh, as we said before, the gel electrophoresis is a very important process by which uh, it is a method to separate the DNA fragments. These fragments are separated ba based on their charge and on their size. So first of all, we are going to get the DNA sample. We are going to place the DNA sample with the restriction enzymes that are going to cut the DNA into fragments. These fragments are going to be placed in, a, uh, spe in special wells placed on the agarose gel. This is a very important gel which facilitates the migration of the DNA across it. After that, we are going to turn the electric current. Usually we place the DNA in special wells at the negative terminal of this uh, agarose gel. And because the DNA are naturally negatively charged, this is due to the presence of the phosphate groups, after we turn on the electric current, the DNA fragments are going to start migrating from this terminal towards the positive terminal. So from here till here, okay? After that, we are going to, upon uh, autoradiography, we can localize the bands of the DNA that have migrated. Of course, the smaller DNA, the smaller DNA, which means the fragments which are made up of uh, uh, the minimal number of base pairs, are the ones that are going to migrate faster. Okay, so they are going to cover the bigger uh, distance, the, the largest distance, while the ones having the biggest uh, uh, size or uh, their base pairs is big in number are the ones that are going to migrate slower and they are going to remain at a shorter distance from the terminal where we place them. DNA fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting is also known as DNA profiling and it is a very important method which is used to identify an individual by uh, taking a sample of the DNA of this individual because it's supposed to be unique to this individual. The technique of the uh, fingerprinting and how is the fingerprinting technique applied? First of all, we are supposed to get the sample from where the DNA has to be extracted. The sample can be simply obtained from blood. After that, we're supposed to isolate the DNA from this sample. And then we place the DNA with restriction enzymes in which they are going to give the fragments. And the fragments are gonna be placed on the agarose gel. It's the, similar, it's the same technique as the gel electrophoresis that we've been discussing. And then after that, we are going to move the uh, this gel containing the bands into a special nitrocellulose filter and this is now the dna fingerprinting preceding the uh, gel electrophoresis and it's also known as the southern blot technique after addition or placing these uh, this uh, gel having the bands into a nitrocellulose filter we are supposed to add the uh, radioactive probes which are complementary single-stranded uh, dna molecules uh, which are going to hybridize to the to, to their complementary sequences that are present after that, we're supposed to wash uh, to eliminate the excess probes which are not hybridized to the DNA. After that, uh, we are going to develop X-ray film to detect the radioactivity and this will allow us to visualize the patterns of the DNA uh, which is specific for each individual and this is gonna allow us to compare between the DNA of different individuals. The uses of the DNA fingerprinting, or why do, we do we, why do we usually apply this technique? Usually in the DNA fingerprinting, scientists simply collect samples of the DNA from different sources. For example, and most importantly, in crime scenes, if there is any uh, criminal who is not known, they will collect the DNA from the crime scene, and they are going to compare the sample of DNA with other samples for uh, suspects that might be uh, the ones that have undergone this, uh, cr uh, this crime. 
So this can be taken from a hair left behind at the crime scene or from blood of the victims and suspects. And uh, then, then they narrow in on the stretches of the repetitive DNA scattered throughout these samples, which will allow them to know the uh, criminal. Also, a very important use for the DNA fingerprinting is to determine the parenthood. So if a child, uh, if, if, if a father wants to know if he's the biological, uh, chi uh, the biological father of his son or uh, daughter, he can also refer to the DNA fingerprinting to detect uh, the parenthood. To match tissues of organ donors with uh, those of people who need transplants is also a very important use for the finger DNA fingerprinting. To identify diseases that are passed down through your family and this will help find cures for those diseases uh, known as hereditary conditions. Here is an example of a DNA fingerprint which is uh, done. Here, this is the DNA collected from a special crime scene. And we have three suspects here, which are suspected to be the criminals. So if we, we also did the DNA fingerprinting for the three suspects in order to compare it with the DNA that was obtained from the crime scene. If you take a look, this band here doesn't, ba doesn't match with the band of suspect one or with the band of suspect three but it matches with the band of suspect 2 and similarly for the rest of the bands. <clears throat> Let's do a pause before we proceed. Okay, so we shall proceed with what we started regarding this uh, document so as you can see that the uh, that the uh, dna collected from the crime scene matches with the suspect number two so this has allowed us to know that suspect two is the criminal whose dna was found at the crime scene Localization of a gene on a chromosome. This is a very important technique which is used to locate a gene on a chromosome and it is known as the FISH technique or it is known as the fluorescence in cyto hybridization. This technique depends on the use of single-stranded DNA uh, sequences which are known as the probes. Definitely they are flu fluorescence, uh, fluorescent uh, probes in order for us to visualize them. And it is a test that maps the genetic material in a person's cell in a way that can be used to visualize a specific genes. So it allows us to visualize specific genes on special gene maps. Uh, fish testing can be done on breast cancer tissue. This is a very important application for fish testing because uh, we can uh, apply it on breast cancer tissue. Uh, which can be removed during a biopsy to check if the cells have an extra copy of, uh, of uh, HER2 gene, which is a gene involved in breast cancer when it does a certain mutation. This is how we apply the FISH technique. First of all, we have the DNA, which is going to be denatured in order to uh, allow the unwinding of the DNA to move uh, away from each other. So when we add these uh, fluorescent probes, which are single-stranded DNA molecules, we will give them the chance to bind to their complementary sequences, as you can see here. So when they bind to their complementary sequences, we are going to visualize a fluorescence, so we can see fluorescence at the level of the site where this probe has hybridized. This is how uh, we are going to see the genes, the localized genes by the FISH technique. So we can use multiple uh, probes. Some of them can be colored red, some of them colored yellow, white, blue, or whatever, in order to localize more than one gene at the same time uh, after they bind. Another uh, very important uh, topic to discuss is the restriction fragment length polymorphism or RFLPs. Uh, the RFLPs is a difference in the homologous DNA sequences that can be detected by the presence of fragments of different lengths after the digestion of the DNA samples in question with specific restriction endonucleases. 
This technique involves cutting special regions of the DNA with known variability. They are, their variability is well known. With, of course, restriction enzymes and then separating them by gel electrophoresis applied on agarose, which will determine the number of fragments and the relative sizes of these fragments, of course. This important technique usually occurs when the length of a detected fragment differs between individuals. So this is going to give us a uh, visualization of the differences between two individuals, which is not only uh, going to give uh, differences at the level of the phenotype, because when these differences occur at the level of the coding regions, they are going to be easily detected at the level of the phenotype. But when they occur in the repetitive regions in between those coding regions, then we cannot detect them at the level of the phenotype. And here is the use uh, of the restriction fragment length polymorphism, which is going to give us the difference between the individuals, not only at the level of the coding, but also at the level of the non-coding regions. The RFLP, the protocol in the RFLP, which is going to be applied, is the sample of the DNA, uh, which is gonna be extracted. And after that, uh, it is gonna be uh, it is gonna be placed on nylon membrane uh, in a denaturing solution, and then southern blotting technique. Uh, after the gel electrophoresis is gonna be also applied. Every individual has a unique genetic identity, so this is why two RFLPs are ident cannot cannot be identical except for the identical twins. In the assessment of parenthood, every offspring's uh, genetic material is contributed to both parents. So the RFLP and the DNA fingerprinting of an offspring should share common DNA bands with the DNA fingerprints of his or her mother and father. So every band for the child should match with a band either coming from the father or coming from the mother. This is how we uh, determine the parenthood by the uh, RFLPs. Thank you. I hope this uh, video was uh, fruitful and it's time for you now to cover and study the activities on your book.